uh, all of you who are joining the webinar today. Thank you very much for uh, participating in this webinar. And my name is Shaharia, and I'm the moderator for today. So uh, this uh, webinar is actually uh, organized as part of the uh, lecture series in partnership with International University and University of Technology Malaysia UTM under the program of architecture. And today is the third series of international webinar that has been organized. So uh, let's welcome our dear speaker of today. Uh, speaker number one is uh, Associate Professor Dr. Dana Servant from Universidad de Alicante, Spain, that will be presenting a topic titled Prefab Mod Modular Aggregative System, uh, Academic Experience and a Real Case of Organic growth based on the addition of this prefab cell. Our speaker number two, Professor Dr. Michael Karasovich from Velo Institute of Technology India, presenting a topic titled Housing, Justice and Architectural Practice. Our third speaker, uh, Senior Lecturer Dr. Azazila Musa Ramdani from UTM and will be presenting a topic titled Affordable Housing Design Challenges and Prospect in Malaysia. Um, okay, uh, so uh, uh, before we begin, I just would like to inform the if uh, the audi audience would like to have uh, uh, questions. Uh, the questions uh, and Q&A session will be at the end of the webinar. So please uh, tap your questions via chat column. And also please be reminded the attendant uh, link will be provided before the Q&A session, which will be at the column, uh, at the chat, chat column. So, okay, uh, without further ado, so let's invite uh, our Director of Architecture Program UTM, Associate Professor Dr. Ellie Sabrina as well for uh, one or two words of uh, welcome remarks. So the floor is yours, Dr. Ellis. Okay, thank you so much, uh, Madam Moderator, Dr. Shaharia. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Uh, good morning, welcome and uh, selamat datang. Uh, especially to our honourable guest speaker, Professor Dr. Michael Karaswish from the Law Institute of Technology, India, and also to Dr. Daniel Servian from Universidad Alicante, Spain, and to all uh, my dear friends, colleagues, and participants, and students from India, Indonesia, and also from Malaysia. So thank you so much for attending this today's third, what we call it, the third international webinar series. So today's webinar talk is the third one and it's actually held by the UTM Architecture School. So as a director of the UTM Architecture School, actually I feel very honored to have uh, these two wonderful and prominent successful speakers uh, from VIT uh, and also from Universidad Alicante from Spain to share their interests and niche areas focusing on the issues of housing across the globe. So today's webinar actually is an eye opener to all because we know that housing and human settlements are a big challenge faced by all, especially in the developed or in the well-developed countries throughout the world. So let us begin for this today's intellectual discourse be a starting point to spark the discourse on housing and human settlements in the 21st century. And we will discuss today what are the best options, what are the good approaches for academicians, designers, and also thinkers to give the best idea and input based on our researchers to improve the quality of life and the way how we live in. So like Winston Churchill always say that we shape our buildings and thereafter they shape us. So because the mother of art is architecture, without an architecture of our own, we have no soul of our own civilization. So today's discourse also is actually a collaborative effort uh, between three institutions, uh, the Law Institute of Technology, uh, and also from uh, India, and also from Spain, Alacante Universidad, and also from Malaysia University Technology Malaysia. So I hope that this course will strengthen the ties for further research and academic collaboration uh, between these three universities, uh, Universidad Alicante, Spain, Veloz, University Technology, University, and also University Technology Malaysia. So with that, um, I wish everyone the very best for today's event and for today's webinar. And I look forward for our collaborations in the future with Universidad Alicante, Spain, and also with VIT. So with that, thank you all. And I hope we had a good webinar today.
and may benefit to all of us. So thank you very much. So I pass this floor back uh, to the Madam Moderator, Dr. Shaharia. Thank you again. Okay, okay thank you very much, uh, as I said, said, Dr. Ellis, for that oh, wonderful welcome remarks. Okay, so um, now without further ado, let's invite our dear uh, speakers, number one, Associate Professor Dr. Daniel Servan to present today's topics. Over to you, Dr. Daniel. Good morning again. How are you? Okay, I will try to share my video. It's the first time I use this software. Um, I don't know if it's going to work. I think yes. So here is should be. I don't know if you can see or not. Uh, can you see? Not yet. Okay. Uh, now you can see it. Uh, hello. Yep, it's good. Yep, it's good. We can see it clearly now. Yep. Okay. So I start with it. Uh, well, uh, I'm going to to talk about uh, three. Um, my lecture is about the three. Steps. First step is a small definition of what is this system of uh, light prefabricated uh, modular relative system. And then my academic academic experience, and then uh, about a house uh, I have just made right now. So well, this is the picture I told you before. Uh, here in the southeast of Spain is where I am in Alicante, uh, in the uh, west part of uh, Europe, and uh, this is my city. This is Alicante. Uh, Alicante is a place for holiday, uh, a lot of beaches at the end of these mountains is where I am right now, at the end, so there is where I live. Uh, and, uh, this is my university, this is the Politica University that I have been for the last uh, 20 years. Uh, well, this is a part of uh, this university, and uh, you can see uh, this one is a very rational plan. It was a building made in the uh, uh, 20 years ago. And uh, with this picture, the first uh, concept uh, of uh, my systems are modular, the modular systems. And uh, well, this building could be in line of uh, what uh, Smithson uh, called uh, It's a building characterized by uh, mobility, flexibility, and agility. Uh, and it was introduced in the in this project, CMX. And uh, well, this is the University of, of Berlin. And uh, well, if you can see a system that uh, we call the two dimensional modular net, where you have, you can find the uh, volume and circulation in a, in a net, in a two dimensional net. Uh, yeah, later, uh, another architect, uh, Jonah Friedman, uh, used the same concept in his uh, Villa Spatiale. Uh, it's the same grid, uh, but other uh, cities, here yeah, you can see the same grid upon the cities where you can find the same volumes of the mud buildings. And the structure that holds these uh, volumes. Uh, this concept um, is more famous in the unity of where uh, you can find the same concept of uh, a structure, or a structure, what he called a bottle rack, and the uh, apartments uh, that they call the bottles. Uh, here we introduce another thing, these uh, uh, simple elements, this light element, this we call uh, light prefabrication. Light because we use light materials. Not concrete, only steel uh, and wood. And where here you can find this concept: the modules, three-dimensional modules, light modules. And this is the reason that Le Corbusier wanted to use for uh, this detail. And he couldn't uh, make it. Uh, on the line of the system, you can find Archigram, where they use the capsule instead of the travel. Uh, here you can see some of these projects. Uh, is known by mass production. They wanted to create mass production, repetition, standardization, exchange. You can see a famous project, uh, plug-in capsules by Warren uh, The concept you can see is a mega structure, again, with some capsules that you can plug and unplug depending on what you wanted to, to do. Uh, another line uh, of studies are metabolism. That they call the cell, this light prefabricated, they call the cell. Here yeah, you can see a project. And this concept, I can't see, say that in Japanese, this word 
is a word uh, that means something like uh, that is renewal and regeneration. But basically, it's the same type of before in, in Archigram. Uh, you can see the same elements, the megastructure that holds the individual cells, individual fabricated cells. Again, 3D modules. And here's the most known project of this line, the Archigram where you can find, again, the same uh, elements. It is a concrete megastructure that support the individual cells that were, were supposed to change every 20 years. But in fact, it wasn't like this. Uh, they never change, and that's because this thing is almost appearing because it's a very, in a very, very bad condition. The last word we are going to use is aggregative. It's one of these uh, systems. And, uh, well, you can see basically, again, with uh, the Corbusier, you can see the, uh, the um, can you see again this picture? in the picture yes okay thank you so well uh, you have this pavilion of the triple and in the concept of aggregation uh, he only put one uh, unit upon another and here you have this building uh, this is uh, the first uh, meaning of aggregation where you put one onto another and in three lines of space in South America. Here you can't find modules, you can't find a structure. But well, uh, later I'm going to introduce two famous Spanish architects. First is uh, this one, Rafael, who was studying these uh, systems. Uh, he created this element uh, that is called uh, Modulo L, Module uh, L, and he said he could create 144 different shapes with only two of these uh, L elements. Uh, he built only one thing in his life. It was some uh, housing in the year 1975. And uh, it looks like this. Uh, you can't find here modules. You can't find the uh, structure because the technology we had in Spain uh, 40, 50 years ago, it wasn't uh, for creating these light prefabricated elements. But another famous architect is this one. He's uh, Ricardo Phil. And uh, he creates these buildings again with uh, modular aggregation. If you see the models, the models are really amazing. You can see here the individual modules, but uh, we have a lot of buildings with these systems. Here you have another one, the Walden Seven. Walden Seven that was this is in, in Barcelona. And you can see again the model. The model is again amazing. It's made out of aggregation of uh, modules. But the uh, question is that, uh, well, you can see here the modules uh, of these housing modules uh, that create this big building. But the thing is that in the 70s, Spain was a very, very poor country. This is a picture of a film. But you can imagine Spain 50 years ago, it was a lot uh, underdeveloped. And uh, this was the technology they used for creating this building. This is not live, this is not prefabricated, and uh, it's not an aggregation. But in fact, the building looked like it was a uh, uh, light prefabricating modular aggregation. Well, that was uh, the first part of my, of my lecture and introduction of what is uh, light prefabricated technologies. And uh, second, I'm going to talk about my uh, experience because we teach these systems in the last uh, 20 years in London. And uh, I'm going to show you what uh, we do at, at the well, this is the, the guide, the course guide of my, my subject. My subject is called uh, Singular Building Systems and uh, starts in only two hours. So I'm going to finish and I have to leave because I have to go to, to my classes. And, uh, well, we talk about these systems in my class. This is the course guide this year where I explain in Spain and English. Choose a group of, in the morning, a group of people coming from different parts of the world. We talk in English and in the afternoon we talk in Spanish with Spanish people. So this is the course guide where we explain what we do in, in our classes. This is the Spanish studies where we have uh, 10 semesters or five years. And my signature, my topic is here in the seventh semester, in the fourth level. And the problem of teaching in Spain is uh, something like this. You can see in this uh, picture from electronic. From uh, the problem is that uh, the different areas, uh, structures, uh, facilities, urbanism, and projects, they are not separate. They do uh, individual projects, and uh, it was not funny because the students have uh, different points of view, but not on the same project. 
So I have been traveling in uh, different universities in the last three years, and I have seen the system is more kind than this Spanish system, is something like that, where everybody uh, participates in the party. Uh, well, here is a joke. <laughs> well, normally uh, all the areas of, uh, of the project construction, urbanism, structures, and facilities, they, they, same, uh, they share the same project. So I wanted to create a similarity in my subject. So I developed uh, a system, I can call something like that. The system is called the method, idea of the last construction. This is the book I made uh, 10 years ago, and it's the book I think we are using in our classes. And uh, well, this is not the concept. idea plus construction is a concept that uh, developed uh, Walter Gropius in the Bauhaus. Uh, he called uh, in German, uh, Professor Michael knows and the uh, technique uh, Eine neue uh, Einheit. It's something like uh, uh, idea plus technology and, and new unity. So they wanted to work together the idea and technology. And this is what I want to do in my classes. So I developed uh, this system, uh, this split. Uh, this is the semester uh, program. We have 14 weeks starting the 14th of September uh, and uh, finishing on 21st of December. So that means that today we are in week 10. And uh, this planning is divided into four uh, different steps. The first step is to analyze. Second step is to think. The third step is to act. And the last step is to communicate. So this is what we do in the different uh, four phases of our course. Um, this course uh, is based on something that I call the 25 ingredients. It's something like uh, you have to think when you are thinking in architecture, you see these 25 ingredients. So in the first uh, phase, in the phase of thinking, we develop these 25 uh, ingredients. They are grouped in the different areas I told before: projects, uh, urbanism, structures, facilities, technology and composition. And the last five is about uh, specific uh, variables about prefabricated architecture. So uh, we developed this, and the more interesting thing is that these uh, ingredients uh, are equal to plans in the second phase, in the phase of act. Uh, so the thing is that you have one variable for one plan. So the work that the students develop in the first phase are exactly the plans that they are going to submit in the second phase of work. So this is the system I have been working in the last years, and I'm going to show you right now how it works. Well, this year, uh, in August, we saw these pictures. Uh, these pictures are from uh, from uh, uh, sorry Afghanistan. And we saw a lot of people going out from this country, and uh, these people went to these uh, camps, to these temporary camps in different parts of the world. And uh, we thought that uh, this is not exactly architecture. We thought that this is technology, but architecture. Architecture is something else, much more than uh, some uh, needs. So we wanted to create some special systems for migrants. And this is what we are developing. Instead of the speakers, where you can see uh, the migrants in a very poor conditions, we wanted to create something else, something better. So this is what we are developing uh, this year. So in the first phase, in analyze, we started to uh, study uh, in these two first weeks of the year. We started to study the user of, uh, of this of course, the Afghan people, but not only the Afghan people, but here maybe you have heard about a volcano in Spain, in South Spain. So we have some people that lost everything. So we, we wanted to create something for these people that lost uh, their homes and want and need something else. It's also the space because we have only small space. We can't afford a home for these people because they are temporary shelters. We study the space and, of course, we study the technology. The technology created uh, cells and aggregation of them to create uh, the shelter. So, this system is based on two elements the individual cells, and we studied, uh, for example, in my life in a car, or maybe you have seen this film. Uh, uh, they live in a, in a van. Uh, we also started a small uh, cabana of Le Corbusier. And why not the center of a bomber? <laughs> we studied the small uh, pieces for people, and that was the reason we studied. And then we studied the aggregation. And we uh, unit all these individual cells into a individual building aggregation. That was the first, uh, the first uh, step. 
Then the second step and the most important thing, uh, this takes us something like six weeks, and this is uh, six weeks plus a uh, submission. We did it last week, and every week is based on one area. First week is for project, second week for urbanism, third week for structure, fourth week for cities, fifth week for technology, and the sixth week for composition. And now I'm going to show you the work of my students in every of these weeks and every of these uh, 25 variables. Uh, one thing is that uh, we believe in this, this is simple, to think with our hands and to build with our head. That means that uh, we want to use the pencil in these pictures, not because it's something old, something being touched, it's that we think that we think better with hands. Better with so it's a curious thing that the students in fourth level, in seventh semester, they find with the pencils again to draw again. Let's up with the method, and you are going to see the results right now. So we're going to start with the first 20 variables. So uh, the current variable is about the current status. Uh, well, this variable uh, is about the previous area. So first, uh, first, uh, first of these ingredients is about the current status. Data collecting, drawing plans, bibliography search, finding the context of the project. The second is to define a program of uses. How is the space there? And here you can see one student that uh, used the individual cells for individual functions. One cell for kitchen, one cell for bank, one cell for We have something like uh, 70 students. And they are group in uh, groups of three students. So we have 60 projects. This is only one of them, and we are going to see different projects. Not the same project all the time. Well, the third ingredient is the design of the interior space, depending on its use. It's called external modules. So here you can see an aggregation of these individual modules to show the uh, previous picture. And well, later you will see the gate with this system. The fourth um, ingredient is uh, the most important for me. It's a very powerful, overwhelming project idea. And in this idea, they developed these sketches in 3D sketches where they show uh, what is the idea of the project. Uh -huh. this is... uh -huh. So uh, this is the, uh, the part of the projects, the idea of the, of the students. And the last variable of projects, the fifth ingredient, is the conceptual model. They also work with models uh, where they can practice about the different possibilities of the aggregation. You can see that a negative system is a system that allows different partnerships depending on how you connect the individual. So what they do in these models is to try how the shape changes depending on how they aggregate uh, the individual cells. Uh, in the second week, we are talking about the urbanism, another area, urbanism, and here is about what, call, what we call the geometric modules. Modules, spatial rhythms, structural axes. You can see the are based on a modular grid because uh, we use the UFS, uh, we use a prefabricated system of modular grids. Uh, the, uh, another ingredient is the uh, they adapt these grids to the final plot because we have a final plot. So they have this uh, system that can grow uh, indefinitely in the two dimensional, but they have some limits. And here they show the limit of this proposal. And the third is the functional distribution of the plot. Here you can see the plot selected by students because they select the place and the different aggregations located in this plot that they selected. The third week, about the structures. Instead, uh, inside the structures, we talk about what we call the construction module. How are the different types of the prefabricated cells? This is a beautiful picture of one student that creates uh, a lot of different individual cells in order to create the project. You will see later this image of the project. And sometimes they use computer because sometimes it's hard to do all these things by hand. So I understand in some draws they have to use computer, but normally except these uh, elements, uh, normally they do it. For example, this one. Uh, in this one, it is what they called uh, the structural system, where you can see the individual cells, but also these pillars, this what we call mega structure, and the vertical cores of communication of these individual elements, of these individual uh, cells that 
are starting to get against these pictures. Also, talking about what happened with the encounter with the ground. Here we have the ground, and this is the project. In this case, uh, the encounter between the project and the land, uh, you have to study how it looks like. In this case, uh, they have some slopes, and they have to create these pillars to develop these muscles. Well, the fourth week, we talked about uh, facilities, uh, installations, and this is an important point of uh, change where they need to uh, study with the sun because in Spain it's quite hard, and uh, they have to create architecture depending on the elements for protecting from the sun. So here you can see how the facilities can change, can change the project, create new ideas only if you think about the different elements for protecting from the sun. This is a beautiful project where I create the image of the project only by using elements uh, for creating privacy and protecting from the sun. This is another cell where you can see how the um, element grows in the center and decrease in the extremes, so they are better for the sun, better for the winds, and so on. Another example of how the energy systems create the shape of architecture that we will also increase. In the last one of facilities, we started the thermal envelope, thermal bridges, and so on. So we still make some details. You can see how the scale is changing from the big scale the small scale, uh, and they do it in only a few weeks. On the fifth week, we talk about technology, technology, materials, systems, uh, functions, unions, manufacturers, and so on. This is a beautiful section of one project where we show all the elements, the structural elements, and the finishing elements of this process. We make this kind of studies where we study different types in a table where we talk about materials and functions of these materials because we use what we call uh, multi layer systems. So we, we need to uh, study in every layer what function that we have every, every layer. And uh, in the last group, we have the technology. In the technology, we study the envelope, the global envelope, the thermal envelope, and so on. Uh, this is a system that can grow. So we study also different pieces of growth depending on the moment. For example, you can have the first phase, you can add more individual cells and it will grow and it will be, get bigger. So these systems are never finished because you can add and detach as much individual cells as much you need. So they study different phases of growth depending on how many cells, uh, individual cells do you have in this building. Time, what we call here. Uh, we have, uh, again, the conceptual idea after uh, entering these inputs, the, for example, these solar, these solar panels in the system, uh, wind generators also, and we see the final image of the project after uh, putting inside different elements for uh, controlling the demand and, and so on. And the last of these 20 variables is this one, where you see a global vision of the technology. You see the different elements that they are using, the different functions, again, what it looks like. Um, this is more uh, architectural, you see the texture of these elements, and, and so on. And uh, this is the final uh, progress in the first phase where they are still thinking about the project. Now we jump in the other step, the step is ACT. I called ACT uh, to the phase of uh, drawing all the plans of the final proposal uh, to have kind of uh, execution project for constructing. So this is where they are now. They are now. We are here today, the second phase the day 23 of November, and uh, this is what they have right now. They start with some people when they know exactly what kind of materials, what final shape, what elements, and so on. And uh, well, we will have uh, four more weeks for developing the final plans of the proposal before they have think about all the different ingredients of the and uh, for finishing, the last part is and in the last day of class, uh, in 21st December, uh, they talk in public about uh, the proposals. So the students, and uh, this is what they do. They explain the proposals. This, of course, these pictures are from the last year because we still have not yet this part. And uh, they talk about this proposal in a short uh, lecture. That uh, we use the format of Pecha Kucha. I don't know if you know this format, Pecha Kucha. It's 20 slides in uh, 20 seconds each. So, with this format, we explain the project. And after that, we make a small picnic. 
Uh, it was funny because these are the international people. Uh, this guy is from India. Uh, this girl is from Slovenia. And they bring the traditional food. And the last day we make kind of picnic with the traditional food of the country of the students. Well, and the picture is about a prefab house that we created from here uh, with these technologies. And uh, this is me um, in this in the factory where uh, they are um, having these uh, individual elements. And uh, well, uh, I'm going to talk about this house that is looks like kind of traditional. We are using ten individual modules, seven in the basement and three more in the upper part. So it's ten individual cells that create this aggregation. This is not 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 especially interesting. Uh, technology. So we are going to talk about the last five ingredients that we are doing because we are uh, working on them right now with this house. The first is the storyboard. That means uh, the different pieces of the work. Uh, well, this is the plan, and this is how we build this house. Uh, as I told you before, we can see uh, seven uh, individual modules in the lower place and three more in the upper part of the of the house. We built the entire house inside the factory. Uh, the picture was took uh, was took on 2018, three years ago. And uh, here you can see the development of the different uh, modules. At the same time, on the final place, they were creating the foundations for this house. This is the final place, and this is the foundations. More or less at the same time, factory on this on these uh, individual uh, modules. 22 uh, 22 ingredient is the workshop, the workshop, the workshop and the detail drawings about the components. Here you can see how the individual cells are growing. They look like they are together, but they are actually separate. Uh, they are individual, but the house together in the factory. You can see here there are, there are the, the different elements of the walls, the uh, uh, elements and so on. Well, uh, I still say that uh, it was not a continuous process because the construction had some problems uh, with uh, technology. He couldn't understand the technology. Uh, the house was stopped for several periods of time. And the uh, most uh, important that was uh, February 2018. Maybe you know this time because only one month later uh, came the pandemic. So we have the COVID and we have to stop everything. That's because I put this because we have to stop for a lot of time. And after COVID uh, in 2021, yes, okay. one year and a half later, the house still was there, but they were uh, getting ready for transporting the different elements to the final place. So this is the 23 ingredient transport, the regulations, limitations, authorizations, and so on. This is an important part of the thing because in the north part you can see Alicante, here is San Vicente, here is also the university it's in San Vicente. So that means that the factory is close to my university. It's only one kilometer. So I could go to the university and the factory on the same day. I could control the house. And the final place is down in the map is uh, called Los Montesinos. It's uh, 62 kilometers. And that was the final place of the house. And well, about the transport, the most important is the, the door, <laughs> the door of the factory. All these modules go out of the factory. So you have to know exactly the measures before getting them, because if not, you can't take out them from the factory. You also have to think in the process of taking these elements out of the factory. We need two tracks to move these elements out of the factory. Here you can see how they are moving one of these seven uh, individual elements. How they are putting into tracks. Here you have the first track out of the factory, and uh, here is in transport. We are transporting these individual elements to the final place one by one. And uh, here you can see how important it is to study the track because here you can see a 90 degrees uh, turn, and here you can see the track trying to make this 90 degree uh, turn. So before designing these elements, you need to know exactly this uh, route. In order to avoid these uh, problems, twenty uh, fourth uh, is the assembly, different uh, individual elements in the final place. In this, in this place, we have no problems because you can see we had a lot of space. So, a lot of space for stoking the different elements, a lot of space for the machines and the cranes and so on. And here you see the final place, uh, we have a lot of space, so no problem at all to put the 
So here you can see how they move the different elements and they put in the final location. We saw it before, one by one. They will have the first of all, the first of the modules. Then so you have a second, and like this, all the different modules. And here you can see the trade between the two different individual elements and the small detail of how they uh, join together the different elements on the final place. And this is the last track with the last three modules. The upper part, they went in only one track and uh, they will get the last elements uh, at the end of the day. So, well, actually not one day, but two days. Uh, they use it two days with the 10 different individual modules. That ingredient, and for finishing my lecture, uh, you have the details about the assembly of the modules. Once you have the modules on the side, you need to uh, join them. Uh, for example, here you can see a join in the floor, a join in the upper part, and also in the roof. In the roof, you have to join the different elements to uh, the water inside. Here you have the details in the original project, and inside, some pictures from inside uh, within the same way. Some details from these uh, joints of elements. And uh, one eternity later, that means uh, something like four years later, finally uh, we have uh, our home more or less, more or less assembled because it is still finished because of some problems with the constructor, but more or less we have to it. Yeah. So that was all. Uh, it was exactly 30 minutes. Thank you a lot for your attention. And if you want something else, uh, ask me if you want. Thanks you again for inviting me to this. Uh, Uh, okay, thank you very much, uh, Doctor, for the insight. It was a very great uh, sharing on the light fabrication and cells, the experience that Dr. Daniel has shared with us, the uh, academic experience with students, which consists the analyzing, think, act, and communicate from the construct phase zero until phase four. Thank you very much. Uh, okay, to the audience, please be reminded that attendance list will be provided before the uh, Q and A session, which will be at the chat column. All right. Uh, without further ado, let's uh, invite our second speaker, Professor Dr. Michael, for the next presentation. The virtual floor is yours, Professor. Thank you. Um, uh, I'm going to. Okay, first I'll try and get this uh, sharing going here. Let's try. I'll try the PDF for safety. Um, how's that looking? Okay, it's still sharing. Um, it's, uh, okay. Sorry, oops, cancel. I'm trying, uh, yeah, is it there? Yeah. Okay, is you it full see. screen? Are you seeing full screen or just are you still seeing the menu bar at the top? We can see the menu bar at the top, uh, but it's, we can it's see. It's interesting. I, I use I use Control L for full screen, and um, that actually also uh, causes me to leave the the event here. So I think I won't use Control L. Um, let me just review. Uh, page display. Full screen. Where the heck is the full screen here? Sorry. Full screen, page display. Come on. Oh, here it is. Okay, got it. Okay, is that showing as full screen? Yes. Okay. Yes. So um, we're talking about uh, how this is going to be in the introductions. We're going to um, work for academia and all of that. I'm focusing primarily on architecture um, in general. I don't really have a focus of a particular thing, but you know, housing is inevitable. Housing is inevitable if you're an architect, right? And the approach is that academia always serves practice, right? What would be the purpose of academia if it didn't serve practice? Um, so that's kind of the orientation I have here. So I have four basic points that I'm gonna talk about. My point of view is, you know, uh, in the sense that uh, we're not actually providing housing in a very fair way, or let's say our society doesn't provide it, you know, and, and I'm talking a little bit about, you know, uh, indirectly about architects role, 
through the different things I'm going to discuss here. So I'm going to try and go pretty quickly through these slides so I don't go too much over 30 minutes. So number one, the founding uh, injustice is that everybody requires a home. This is a fact, but what we have is a situation where where homes are. Um, well, we'll get into it. homes are not actually um, presented as a need. They're presented as kind of an option. The second thing is nomadism. Doesn't really um, isn't really sanctioned in our cultures. I know that very well as a Canadian where they basically stopped all the nomadic cultures from moving around the country and forced them into settlements. And forced them into starvation and sickness because those settlements did not have enough food. They did not have any facilities. They did not have any way to participate, but they were forced into these settlements. So nomadism is a real problem. It's very interesting that um, that archigram is a bizarre combination. Those projects are a bizarre combination between extreme corporatism, where you have these massive buildings which no individual can create, and at the same time you have nomadic units that are supposed to move around freely which are forbidden. They are not allowed in our cultures, in our Western cultures. Nomadism in most of the Western or most of the world cultures is, is disallowed. So I just gave these pictures of nomadism versus ownership. Okay. Ownership is a really interesting uh, thing. If you look at the uh, rich countries in Europe and around the world, you see that um, ownership is really quite high. Uh, most people own their homes. And if you look at this graph, you see there's actually three kind of broad classifications. There's a really ubiquitous ownership, um, two thirds ownership, and less 50%, very low below ownership. And the interesting thing is low ownership is in the countries of Switzerland, Germany, Austria, really rich countries. They have low ownership and high rental because it's controlled. Luxembourg, one of the richest countries in the world, is just 60%. The high ownership is in the very poor countries. The poorest countries in the ex Soviet or the ex uh, CCR company countries, the, you know, Macedonia and places like that, they have high ownership. Um, so it's interesting. There's a very peculiar dynamic, which is swirling around in ownership. Um, I'm just bringing this in as a, as, as a framing the approach. So the next thing is that rising price of houses. Which are going out the ceiling, right? Housing in all the nice places of the world are being bought up. And, and the prices are going uh, very, very extreme. In Canada, for six years, the price of housing has risen 10% per month for six years. That is, when I go back to Canada, I have to have a million dollars to buy anything in any city. It's impossible because the housing is being bought at, a, at I mean, it's being bought as, a, as an investment. The other thing that's interesting to see is that in the new countries like Canada, Australia, United States mortgages are really big, but in other countries like Italy and uh, Austria and Germany, uh, mortgages are less. People either own their home or they rent, but the buying of the house and the whole mortgage industry is small. Mortgage industry, it's it's a it's a it's promoted in the United States. We know that the last crash came because of this idea of people paying banks to let them have their house earlier or a bigger house earlier. So the whole business of spending money and having an industry of funding houses is a really big part of, of some countries work. Now, if we, and this is all, you know, this is tons of stuff on the internet. If you look at homelessness though, it's really scattered. The data is ancient. It's only partial, it's minimal. Main reason, there's no money in studying homelessness. There's no money in it. It's not about money. Homelessness is about the lack of money. So we have a real problem with doing that. So. But interestingly, if you look at the basic data, France, the United States have the highest homelessness in the rich countries. France also has the most subsidized housing in the rich countries. It's a very, very amazing swirling pot of effects. But this is only to portray the idea of, you know, that homes are part of business. Homes are part of industry and not a part of just life's need. We know that getting a home is life altering. We've seen so many people who've been homeless who have gotten a home and how it just changes their life. Their children can study, they sleep, something. Not having a home can kill you, right? In some places like in Canada, where it's minus 30, you will die, right? You will simply die. 
unless you have very good uh, native skills to live in the forest and to understand how to live in the wilderness, which is, of course, what they did before technology came along. They lived without the kind of homes we have, though they had their nomadic homes. They brought their homes with them. So one question we have is the nomad homeless. Uh, can you, you know, taking your home with you is a great deal dream, but nobody does it. Right? Nobody does it. It doesn't happen. And as we saw with the capsule hotel, even changing those capsules never happens. There's a real, there's a real gap there. So why am I going through this? Okay. Um, the idea of homelessness, um, I think, can be encapsulated with this little uh, thing from Christopher Alexander. Uh, as with so many people, Christopher Alexander also spent some months in India. Formative months. This is a picture of the village he lived in. And the village he lived in had a central space, which this is the central space for the whole village. And they spent every evening in this space talking and being together. The idea of having a home was partially dissolved in this place because people were so at home in the community that they slept in different places sometimes. They didn't necessarily need a home because they were at home in their village. They didn't need a specific home. They were at home in their village. This is the headman of the village. And he was guiding everyone and he guided, he was, uh, he was like the person, the go-to person for advice. He was truly living in charge. And he also guided Christopher Alexander as a young man in that place. He was a very big influence. And Christopher Alexander went on to develop all of his work, primarily out of this idea of creating a beautiful place to live, home. All of his work really came out of that one thing, which he prefaces a timeless way of building with. And so he develops homes of different kinds and very, very um, interesting methodologies in a certain way, completely the opposite of prefabrication because his homes were made by being in the place and evolving the spaces, especially this building here, evolving the spaces out of being in the place itself. They were completely one-offs. There was no reproduction, no prefabrication, no anything. It was absolutely here and now, and for this place only. So that's a very interesting thing that he came up with because of course the, the old place that he was in was non-reproducible. And in fact, the funny thing about it is if you look at where the architecture is, it's very hard to find here. It's the experience of being in the space, which is something I'm gonna focus on later. So given this problem that, um, that uh, housing has been turned into an economy and that architects themselves do that, we focus only on the inside of the house and the house object itself. So the question is, do we encompass or integrate the technical and human properties of our surrounding society and cultures and what it means to be secure at a home in our project parameters? Rarely, we focus only on the object. So I'm saying that to be taken seriously, a lifelong student of architecture would have to know about the second one I mentioned here about the broader parameters as part of the design parameters, not as uh, context, but you have to think about that. And this little presentation here is taking that to heart. Okay, we'll go forward with that. So, housing in almost all size societies today is essentially unjust, being at the mercy of transient and fickle economic and political fates. Is housing optional? No. How is architectural work responsible for that? That's how I'm going to start here. And that's one fifth of my presentation now, roughly. <laughs> that's my start. So let's talk about some forms of the lack of justice in housing. So we'll go with one that's really obvious in India. Every thesis year, there are two or three slum projects. People are interested in slums, people work with slums. The essence of, say, for example, I lived in Delhi or the NCR for two years. And one of the facts is Delhi does not exist without slums. They need the slums. When we were living in our house, we could not take our help into our house because we could not pay them that amount that they were asking. And we also could not pay them what we wanted to pay them because the neighbors would be upset that we would raise the price so high. Because we, you know, we couldn't fathom paying them such small amounts for being in our house so much. So we never had any help because it was an intolerable conflict for us personally. This is uh, an interesting image of you know, India. And 
you could say that the part on the right is going to take over the part on the left. This is what architects want to do. They want to take chunks out of the left side and turn them into what looks like the right side. That's the idea. But if they do that, nobody's going to iron their clothes anymore for cheap. So there's a big problem. There's a conflict and it's selfishness, but the selfishness is everywhere in the world. I'm not saying India is selfish. I'm saying actually India is in a very good position. Um, so you have slums that look like this, which are very established with paving and probably piping under the ground. And you have slums like this, which are really difficult to even conceive of living in, right? Um, where people are doing business, you know, but they also live there in the muck. So the established um, slum has very interesting properties that I would like to focus on because those are usually lost in slum rehabilitation. These houses have autonomy. They have individuality. They have properties of life. They're lively. They are also probably stinking and very difficult to live in, very noisy and also dangerous. But they have that quality of being in the world and having your feet on the ground and the sky above your head. When people give the slum dwellers a dwelling like this, they lose the feet on the ground, they lose the sky over their head, they lose autonomy, they lose individuality, they lose control over their environment. Yes, they have plumbing and it doesn't stink. So what is your trade-off, right? You have a house like this, which is um, state of the art, has everything in it, and yet um, it has so much missing. And that's what I'd like to focus on because when the students give these housing projects or worse, when they're actually done by governments, they do not take care of the home aspect and they do not give the freedom of home, but they give a house, it gives a house. So it's a, it's a value question, right? Um, the improved housing does not generally retain those qualities. It gives, and it, usually it doesn't even give ownership, right? You lose, you don't have ownership of your house. You're just given it by the government. 110 years ago um, in Austria, when the empire broke, they, they found a lot of money, a lot of assets, and they gave the people houses. They made people's palaces and very famous you know, and that was the time, uh, you know, Marxism was coming up. I wouldn't say communism, but socialism was very strong and they built palaces for the people and these palaces still look like this. I mean, it's been renovated once, but they look almost across Vienna. They all look like this still and in a lot of places because they were built adequately. They were built for people to live properly. But in places where you don't make the spaces proper, you start out with something like this. And one generation later, it looks like this because they're not adequate. They start to become individual again. They start to become because there isn't enough space in them and there isn't enough uh, building substance. They fall apart. They, they don't work properly. They're done as cheaply as possible. Right? So there's, a, there's an issue there. The autonomy is not there and also the generosity is not there. So this is number one. And the interesting thing is in Gurgaon, what you have is the same kind of housing but with money, so it's more tolerable. But it's actually the same kind of housing, just with a bigger balcony and a bigger floor plate, a bigger floor space. And then they have this idea of the paradise has come and we live there now in a perfect world. This is, I mean, I lived in one of these and I, I know the difference. And in fact, what looks so beautiful here ends up looking much like this. So the wealthy people, these apartments all cost two crores, they're all very expensive apartments in very nice place in Gorgao. Um, the IT executives live in these places, but they're not exactly much different from the poor housing. So one wonders who's in control of this thing? You know, who is actually building these and who is it for and what are the benefits? So even the wealthy have a loss of the ground in the sky, massively regimented repetition, no occupation contribution and a loss of autonomy. But that is so much money involved in the rich ones that we don't really question that. Um, my proposal is that it's a devaluation of the home for economic reasons justified by dominant dem demographics, financial methods, and the apathy and occasional hostility that comes with injustice holds this kind of lack of improvement in place. So then we go a little bit to some other examples. I'm, I'm going to go as quickly as possible. I've got lots of pictures. So the indigenous and nomadic peoples in, set in the northern settlements of Canada, 
This is a good example of what's going on there. People have these kind of houses. They used to be more or less nomadic across Canada. Now they're limited to smaller patches of land and they build their houses as best they can um, far away from the city where there's no real economy, right? There's no economy there. They live basically off the land, but they don't have much land to live off. So it makes them poor because they can't go ranging around and have this life where they move when, you know, they don't ever deplete the nature. They just keep moving a nomadic people, right? Now they have to stay in one place and the one place starts to get dirty and used up. There's no more animals to hunt and so on and so on. This is a poorer example. You see the background could be a very beautiful thing, but the way that people live, you know, a broken boat, a car parked in the mud, junk lying all over the place. People can't control their environment. They don't have the money. The houses are falling apart. They're moldy, they're sick houses. Half built houses, they never have the money to finish their houses. It's a very poor environment, which was based on Previous nomadic people trying somehow to fit into a non nomadic in the north. You have houses which are just desperate to stay warm enough with minus 30 and 40. And the astonishing thing is they live in environments like this. But this is how they live and you know, they have the most amazing places to live in. This is these open up most most summers. Now these open up. There were years where the ice never opened, but now the ice opens most of the time. And of course, these houses are sinking into the mud now because, of course, of global warming. These houses used to be on ice. Many of them, they don't sustain the ice all year. So there's a lot of problems there. Suicide rate of teenagers is, you know, one in 10 kills itself. Um, it's horrendous. This has been going on in Canada and continues to go on. And it is impossible to improve the housing because people basically say, the Indians lost, they should get over it. There are a lot of people who are trying very, very hard to improve the situation, but um, they don't have even drinking water. There's 150 towns that don't have drinkable water. They have to boil all their water, have it trucked in. And that has not been fixed even after Trudeau says so many things, right? It's still only, there's still 90 left. They only got 60 done in 50 years, in five years, I mean, in five years with some billion dollars, they couldn't do it because nobody wants to. It began with colonialism, it halted nomadic structure, cultures and structures, and there is no solution because people are expected to belong and to have housing through their own efforts. Our culture says, if you don't have the ability to get a house, too bad for you. This is what architects work with. That's my point. Their architects work with this fact. We don't contradict it. We tend to work with the fact we want the rich people. We want the good people to work with us, but we don't work with the fact that housing is a need and not a privilege. So again, devaluation of the home for political and economic reasons justified by dominant demographics, apathy and occasional hostility. Student housing without windows. You might've heard of this project. This is Munger Hall in Santa Barbara, UC Santa Barbara, one of the richest cities in the entire world. They're building a building for students, 4,500 students with no windows. And you can see the little red box, that's one student room. And this is one student pod. And this is what it's supposed to be like inside. And this is what it's supposed to be like to live there. And this is a room, no windows. Can you imagine being inside a 10 story box somewhere in the middle having this little room? I, I mean, I get a frightened feeling of claustrophobia. Now, the guy who's paying for this building says that he, everybody should stop crying and they should be grateful for his money. And uh, one of the things about light, you know, he says that it's proven it doesn't hurt anybody. Everybody's got a high appreciation of these things, blah, blah, blah. And the university is going with it. And the architects are one architect quit very famously. He said he cannot sustain this. Just the idea of light, I just, um, you know, uh, taking from the AIA. Uh, coursework, there's a simple diagram that um, you can see daylight, you can see the, the uh, light pattern of a fluorescent light pr uh, production um, in the graph and the circadian light sensitivity. Now, most of you probably know that the human eye doesn't have two types of uh, cells, it has three types. And the third type is to recognize a certain light frequency that has to do with the dawn and the dusk. There's a one light cell in the eye that recognize only that light frequency. And, and if you don't have that, you lose track of the day. Your body's metabolism goes out of track. You need to see that. And you can see how 
you know, in, in the fluorescent light, it doesn't respond to that frequency at all. And, and you wouldn't pick it up now. LEDs can be tuned. So LEDs, what they've done is they've made LEDs spike at the circadian light frequency to, to in order to help you. And so a guy like Munger, the rich guy, he can say, look, we've technologically solved the problem and we're, we're good now. But the fact is, well, uh, the fact is that, um, let me go back. I, I kind of put the slide, I would have changed the slides because of the way I'm speaking about this extempore is kind of changing it. But um, the thing that the light, even if you do this little spike to get those other light cells working and you get your metabolism kind of coordinated with the daytime, assuming you turn on your light at dawn and turn it off at dusk, assuming that you do that, right? It's, there's no, no student is going to turn off their light at dusk exactly unless the, you know, the, there's software to keep it tuned into the daytime and you can have in the middle of the building have all lights go off at that time, maybe, or make it turn into candlelight at that time or something. Um, that's all technically possible, but what you don't see out the window is life. And it's been proven over and over and over again that if people do not see things out the window or when people go into a forest, they recalibrate, their whole body recalibrates. They call it forest bathing, which is a really low level of nature uh, appreciation, but you have to see out the window. Now, these are facts that every architect and every probably sociologist, every psychologist, every doctor would probably adhere to. And yet, this guy can create an environment like that based on his financial power. And the administration of the university is not saying no. They're gonna put these 4,500 students into these houses because the money is more important. It's very interesting. And in his statement here, I'd rather be a billionaire and not be loved by everyone than not have any money. There's a big space between being a billionaire and not having any money, right? It's like, you can't, don't be fooled by this kind of thinking. I mean, there's a big space. So money versus the, the right and the need to housing. And now I'm gonna take a little swipe at our own university. We have, uh, a lot of high rises here, they're housing, I don't know what, 25,000 uh, students. Um, these buildings cannot be occupied during COVID, right? Because they're too dependent on the health of young people. The economy of these buildings is a factor of the robustness of youth. If the youth wasn't robust, you could not have housing like this. That is, you're converting the health of students to money. You're converting the health of students to the asset to build this. Turning it the other way, because of this reduction in quality, they have now missed three full semesters of income. How many semesters do they miss? How, many, how much better could you make these apartments with three semesters of income? And how many semesters of income does it take to make these apartments usable during something like COVID, make them healthier for people, right? You can actually start to do the math because right now you could actually look at these buildings and say, okay, we've got so many crores of rupees that we could now take to upgrade this, these buildings. How much could we upgrade them? Could they become healthy? Could they become usable during COVID? So we can look at a kind of a direct linear connection between money and, and health in this way. Um, but the point here is that housing is not a privilege, or is it? Is it a privilege? There are students in one of the towns I lived in in Canada who live in the forest in tents because they can't afford housing in the town where they're studying. They live in tents in Canada, in the in the mud, because they can't afford to house themselves in the town where the where the college is, and and it's only getting worse right now. So there's, there's a really big issue here, which we're kind of have to, you know, so, okay. Devaluation of the home for economic reasons justified by a powerful persons and a governing body's apathy and hedging human health for capital gain, right? Corporate ownership. There was a recent company. There's a company in Canada that has just decided to start buying single family homes to rent. They're going to buy the single family homes, divide them into two and rent two apartments inside a single family home. There was a huge outcry in Canada because they wanted to do this. They felt it was a wrong thing. It was, it was on all the newspapers. They wanted to spend a billion dollars buying houses. Now, what that, what the reason this is bad 
is lost on the company that's trying to buy these houses. They say, we're improving the quality. We're, we're a very upstanding company. We're doing good things because we have set rules. Nobody's going to be without lights. Nobody's going to be with broken plumbing. We'll fix everything. Everybody gets to live in a nice way. So where's the problem? Where's the problem with taking these and turning them into a corporate assets for people to live in? The problem is that ultimately the uh, common idea that housing is an asset takes over over human well-being, an asset for well-being. So you slowly you have a, a deterioration of who should have a house. It becomes a corporate entity. And I'm suspicious that in Switzerland they have such low ownership and such high rentals because in Switzerland corporations own the housing, the banks own the housing. The own the housing is owned by the state or state level uh, entities, right? So they don't have the opportunity to buy houses because they're not there to buy. They're only there for rent. So I want the next step I wanted to look at is achieving net zero injustice. The reason I'm saying net zero injustice is because um, I recently uh, have done a lot of upgrading for my license in the states, and I. I have taken a lot of courses on net zero energy. And one of the things about net zero energy development is that you are supposed to, according to their rules or their suggestions, is to consider the net zero factors at the very, very beginning of a project. You sit down with everybody involved in the project at the very beginning, and I mean everybody, the owners through to the people who are managing, you know, the the heating system and the mechanical systems in the building, you know, everybody you can bring in. And you integrate those concepts and create goals from the very first day before you have any idea of a project, before you have any idea of a scheme, anything like that. So, obviously, this is what we do as architects. I mean, Danny was just showing us the 25 factors and those 25 factors you want to think about right from the beginning. It's not something you can just add 1 after the other. You have to have all 25 at the beginning. And that makes for a very special mind that architects should be famous for, right? Being able to handle such a complex matrix, which not even a quantum computer can handle. Um, so, um, one of the ways to do this is to think about this concept that housing is not a privilege, that housing is a need when an architect is designing their building from the first moment. Now, I'm bringing in another factor, which touches on what Danny's doing. And, and um, what I'm talking about here is all of my lifetime, when I was born, we were taught, I mean, that was starting with this 50s, which I, I didn't know about, but starting in the 50s, there was the idea that technology is going to give us a leisure life, is going to free us up, is going to help us. So we've got all the technology. Where has that time and money gone? Why haven't we benefited? That's part of the fundamental injustice of housing. If housing remains a privilege, that benefit of manufactured homes, modular homes, system-based homes, prefab homes, 3D printed homes, tiny homes, all of the homes, all the benefits go to the profit, not to the homeowner. And the fact is that manufactured homes and massively reproduced homes um, actually don't really speak for the individual family and for the individual situation. They, they actually are, tend to eradicate nature by creating a flat plane, a tabula rasa, and creating a, neg a no man's land and then building a house in the no man's land, which then has made everything so neutral that it starts to seem logical. But the fact is before that there were bugs and little animals and trees and streams and, and homes for little for creatures and energy. If you believe in the energetic world, the devas, that every tree, every plant, every unit of land has its own beings that go into the non visible, the non a perceptible area of energetic life, all of that has been wiped away. And it's justified strangely by the idea that housing is a privilege. So we start out in the 50s with the ideas that you get all these gadgets. Yes, my mother started with a wash machine like that, which took an enormous amount of time to work with before they were really truly automatic. They called these automatic, but they weren't automatic because you had a tub that just wiggles and then you have a roller where you have to put this clothes through by hand. So it didn't really work. And you have the floor cleaner, the, all these gadgets, you know, they were supposed to help us. And then we got to the 60s and 70s where, you know, you like your car so much, you invite it to tea. 
because the car is so important. You bring it to the tea table and give it a cup of tea as well. And, you know, the house was supposed to become accessible. But the profits that were made were enormous by creating this dumbing down of houses and modularity of houses and systematization of housing. That benefit did not go to well being. The benefit went to housing as a capital financial asset. And it was lost to the owners. And then we have this kind of cartoon where the Jetsons, where they're completely freed of work, they're completely freed. Also, Star Trek. In Star Trek, there was no money. Everybody got everything they needed. There was a culture where there was the whole thing had been wiped away. And so we have this image that was brought up in the 50s and 60s of modernism. It has not happened. Instead, we have assembly lines for prefabricated housing. We have housing going up like this um, starting in the 50s. And I mean, they've been examples and Danny has shown an example of how to do it. Why doesn't it happen? Why doesn't it actually become something really powerful in our cultures? The efficiency, because the people who would want it don't because it puts them at the mercy of the big producers of the corporations. It puts them it, it it's dangerous. That's why it's dangerous. So then you have houses which look like this and they go into a field and there's 400 of them or 4000 of them. You know, it's like an apartment building except with a patch of flowers around it, which is 100% better or maybe 1000% better. Um, now we have. Uh, 3D produced homes. Same thing. Same thing. Every university has a program. Eventually, the corporations will be able to make some money from it, and then we'll see what happens. But it's still the same thing as making apartments. It's still the problem. The real problem on the architectural level is who is benefiting. In India, you have this. Uh, situation where there's a factory and they build houses for all the workers. It's really great. There's a picture of the owner on every single house. A picture of the owner on your house. I have autonomy. I yes, but my master is my my boss, right? How are you ever going to get away? It's 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 not the real thing. It's not the real thing. Right? And it could be okay. And it and it is a huge benefit for these people here. There's no doubt it's physically a huge benefit. I'm just trying to make the point of who is really benefiting. Who's really, where is this money going? Where are these assets going? How is the asset being pulled out of well being and given to profit? So we had sameness, plainness, smallness reduction. Now, as we near climate change and eco side, it opportunistically becomes sustainable, eco efficient reuse, reduce, and reuse, right? It's the same. It's just the, it's just, it's it, we haven't touched on the real thing, which this this talk here is trying to touch on. So, if technology is not architecture, where do the benefits end up? Let's put it that way. You know, the financial systems of the world are actually a form of technology. It's a machine. You know, like Matrix, right? The movie Matrix. Everybody knows it, right? It's it's you know that kind of makes it too banal. It's actually much more interesting than that. So, when I go back to this AI net zero buildings. Include all stakeholders from the beginning, set the goals early, model early and often for sun, heat, and so on, right? We model early off. We have the software. It's free. Berkeley, by the way, has a nice software that comes up. So if we say architecture zero injustice, what might these goals be? How do we approach these goals? Take charge of project values early in a full group of stakeholders. How do project opportunities convert into factors for well-being? Actively control how the resources of the project flow to the users. Do not go for minimum costs. Balance cost with maximum value. Model the valuation stream of architectural benefits early and often. There are no modeling softwares for that now, but there might be a place for a modeling software for benefits versus human benefits of well being versus benefits for finance, right? So, my last section here is. Um, the profession. So we've gone to the, uh, the asking the question that you would have to do programmatically. Now, how does that fit into the idea of the profession? Because our profession is very technologically orientated. It's not actually an orientated toward well-being. So um, we have to make changes to the profession. It's my th my thesis, my hypothesis. I'm I'm giving the talk, so I'm just pulling this thing that way, right? We need to make changes in the profession. It does not work for people right now. Architects are not making enough money. We are not respected as somebody 
who is doing the environments that people spend 90% of their time in. Why? Because it's a financial instrument and it's been treated as that and architects get their money from that. I can't afford to design a house for someone made of straw and mud because it doesn't cost anything. I need to have the house made of high technology and expensive things because my percentage is what I feed my kids with. So I can't design straw houses. It's out of the picture. We're paid the wrong way. To make change, we have to change ourselves. Consciousness comes with, with consciousness comes the idea of spirituality, which is nothing more than the question of where am I? What should I do? Who am I? What do I do with this life? That is the fundamental question that spirituality is supposed to represent, although it represents many other things. Architecture and spirituality are original to consciousness in humanity. They are siblings because when I became conscious, I also asked, where am I? What do I do here? How do I make this place comfortable? Does this place represent me? Does it make me feel good? Am I doing my best to keep this place in a good shape? That would be stewardship. Am I doing my best to respect nature, to respect the world, right? That is architecture. It's the external version of the internal version. They're siblings and they came with the idea that I can say, well, here I am. Hey, it's me, right? Adam and Eve, you know, waking up and seeing that, oh, I'm here. This is, this is what architecture represents, but architecture always serves spirituality because you can't take it with you. Maybe you can take something with you when you go beyond this life, but the building you can't take and your money you can't take, that's ancient, right? That's ancient knowledge. So architecture depends on human conscious inner experience. Technology is exteriorized materialistic concept space. It's not nature, at least not in so far, you know, the human being and the human mind is nature, but what we do with it is our choice. All human intentional environments aspire architecture. Housing that does not aspire architecture is technological means not in harmony with nature because aspiration is natural. If it doesn't aspire architecture, it can't be natural. My thesis. Um, so we have professional knowledge. All the degrees you can get, the knowledge, you know, the different schools, UTM, everybody's there learning how to be constructive, how to be an architect, right? But you as an individual are the instrument of all those things. We can make a beautiful house, we can make an efficient house, we can make a house modular, but how does it benefit well being? That's up to us as an individual, right? So how do you change to understand that? And my feeling, my proposition here is that you change yourself. You start with yourself. We have to start with our individual self to change. And so I'm advocating spiritual practice of some sort to evolve your own personal consciousness. This is not religion. This is a method which is primarily based in meditation and other things like that. And there is a direct relationship between spirituality and our inner work and architecture and the outer work. That is where architecture really comes to exist. And it relates to, in this drawing, there's the, there's the inaccessible soul or the ultimate, which we haven't got much to do with. And the body can't really be changed. Our bodies are our bodies. But the mind is what we're given to change everything with. And we are not taking advantage of it to enough of a degree. We're using it for innovation, and for evolution of our technologies, but we're not actually changing our world. And right now we have this opportunity where we need to change our world so desperately. So maybe it will come, maybe it will come. So these practices are there and they can be taken up. So returning back to the theme, how does this idea of consciousness in architecture help us to understand and provide just housing? Change, I would say, in practice, change comes from the architect, aspired from within. If we improve ourselves, we change our conceiving and perceiving of the way things are through our self-understanding and awareness. And that means expanding and deepening the awareness of our, our world and the people in the context and the culture. This need becomes acute when you recognize it within yourself, and that actually becomes a driving force for the outside world. How do you attain a better situation in the outside world, which is called compassion and kindness. Is your building compassionate and kind? 
is your project compassionate and kind? Maybe it's not your fault that the banker has said all these things. Do you want to participate? Can you walk away? So my last slide, research and practice. Why am I here and what am I? How do I house this person who is asking for a house? How do I house this person? I'm not talking about the person who said, I'm gonna spend $60 million on housing, not like Mr. Mung, Munger, right? Munger comes with $200 million. I say, how do I house this person who is asking? It's the student for asking, it's a student. How do I allow the person to find the security, comfort and space to even ask that question? Do I feel so much comfort that I can sit back and say, okay, now who am I? What am I gonna read? What am I gonna do? Can I meditate now? Am I got enough peace to just be myself? Can I find, can I build a building that allows that? I make a nice house, I say, this house will allow it. Yeah, but I can't pay for it. Nobody can pay for that house, right? So it isn't just about making a nice house. And then the question is, how do I have compassion? The architect and practice can aspire architecture through having compassion. So that is my talk. That is uh, as far as I'm going today. How do I get this software? Right. Uh, thank you very much, uh, uh, Professor Dr. Michael, for enlightened sharing on injustice, the low ownership, which open eyes on place to stay or call home. All right. Uh, dear audience, if there are any questions, can tap the questions in the chat box and I will read through and read to our speakers. Okay, uh, let's turn time over to our third speaker, Dr. Azazila, for the next presentation. The floor is yours, Doctor. Thank you so much, um, Mr. Moderator. So, um, let me share my slide first. <coughs> okay, did you see my screen? Uh, so let me put it uh, there. Okay, now can you see my screen? Okay, yes. yes. Clearly, okay, thank yeah. you. Okay, uh, thank you. A uh, very good um here in, in Malaysia is, is is we are in afternoon uh, evening and and um for uh, not in Malaysia uh, good good morning or good afternoons. So um my my talk today is about affordable uh, housing design challenges and prospect in Malaysia. So basically, when we talk about um affordable housing in Malaysia, we need to 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 know what is a uh, the income level in Malaysia. So here is a housing affordable scenario. Uh, uh, in Malaysia, we have uh, classified in three uh, main group, which is T20, M40, and B40. What is that? Uh, T40 is, is, is classified, is, is under top 20% from total population in Malaysia uh, with high income groups. And then um, for M40 is classified as a middle income group, which is 40% uh, from the population Malaysians have uh, in the middle income groups. And also um, B40, B40 is a low income group, which means 40% of, of Malaysian population are uh, in these uh, groups, which is uh, the lower income group. So, so this is three different category um, when we talk about uh, affordable housing, uh, mostly uh, uh, the, uh, the 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 groups that facing a, a problem and issue is more in the lower income group, which is a B40. And 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 recently in in 2015 or 2010 started that um, uh, M40 means a middle income group also facing uh, the problem of uh, affordable house uh, in Malaysia. So. So um, it represents uh, the percent of um, uh, of country populations um, by by the income groups. So next, um, okay, this is a mostly income group. When we talk about the affordable house, yes, um, we need to, to know what is the the, the minimum of um, uh, income that they that they can buy and what is the available house that they uh, that. Uh, uh, available in 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 our country in Malaysia. So basically, uh, for those, this is income rich. This is by household group. So basically, B forty will will have the household income group is is below than four thousand and eight hundred and fifty. And and this is is this is recently. 
2019 and then uh, M40 is is the, the range of uh, in, their income is around 4000 until 10000 um and T20 is is about this is not uh, I'm not focusing on on this group so I'm I'm focusing on the B40 and also M40 so um and then uh, with this uh, uh, main group they also have the stages on the medium uh, medians and also the income range so basically in 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 malaysia uh, for the b40 we have classified also in four groups so uh, so we have b1 until the b4 which is they are also numbers um, um malaysian population that 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 receive the income is uh, a bit less than 2500 ringgits in malaysia so um, uh, for uh, for your information, uh, Malaysia government has set up the minimum income rate is one thousand one thousand and two hundred ringgit. That means uh, the, the minimum is 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 um is a B one uh, below than a B B B ones or B forty groups. So 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 that that is the the real situations. Uh, uh, why uh, most of the, the uh, most of us are facing uh, the, the the problem of affordable housing so here is this um uh, when 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 uh, the government uh, has has do their their statistics the mean and the medium they find out that um uh, in malaysia mostly for women they, their income is around 2000 and 2000 ringgit uh, for of 2090 and 2090 for the men so here is um the, the salary um, is uh, the salary rates are become lower and lower and 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 unfortunately because of pandemic everyone's are, are, are job jobless so that's why the number are decreasing so this also contributes the problems on the issue of, of uh, housing affordable i mean they they cannot they did not afford to buy the house available in, in Malaysia. So in 2020, the number recipient of salary wages increased uh, slowly rates. They mean two, from 2.1% 2 to 9 um, to 95 million percent. So during the same period, a monthly salary wage recorded a double decrease. Uh, it's about 15% from the 2000, 2400 to 2000. So so why 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 I'm portraying this because of this is related to, uh, related to why the, buy uh the house and, and what is the the, the the available or market price uh, housing market price available in in malaysia so here is um the static statistics statistics on the uh, mean and the median salary so here is uh, they have different um uh, when you when you are living in in the urban area so your 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 salary also uh, different so in me higher medians in in urban areas uh you you will will receive uh, is around two thousand and five uh, until the two three thousand. If you are in rural rural area, so you will receive um one thousand and three hundred and also two two thousand ringgit. So with this uh, uh level of income, what uh what types of housing that you can buy in Malaysia? So um here is what the Malaysian level affordable housing. So um when 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 uh, uh, according to the them the more graph we are international housing uh, affordable housing report, uh, reports a median multiples uh, of three and under indicates that housing market are affordable so what is the situation in malaysia so uh, based on the salary and based of the um, housing price in malaysia the malaysian median gross household income is around 5000 according to the latest uh, statistic in 2019 and the medium is uh, the median house price is 300000 in a uh, that is the the median uh, price uh, so when we put this so the multiples at a uh, 4.3 index that that means that uh, malaysia's fall in the seriously unaffordable category um, for for affordable uh, for the housing so here is a uh, malaysia affordable uh, price index so what is available uh, types of uh, housing uh, available in malaysia we see this is um, for all types of house we can see in 2010 uh, if you want to buy a house, a minimum price is about two hundred uh, plus minus is two hundred thousand ringgit, and and unfortunately in two thousand and twenty one, um, the the minimum price uh sales uh, for 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 house in Malaysia is is around four hundred uh, ringgit. So this is um you can see uh, this is classified in under the terrace house, which means uh in ten years ago uh 
we can buy a, a terrace house in 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 this uh in this price 100 uh, 188 uh, ringgits but nowadays we cannot buy uh, we cannot buy with this price and 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 the, the numbers uh, uh, the price is is soaring and 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 um, and um and and increasing dramatically even though we are facing the pandemic so same goes with the sem uh, semi detached and also detached house is nearly uh, is nearly 1 million and 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 what we can buy is only a uh, 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 high rise but but unfortunately high rise also um, nearly 300 uh, um over the 300 ringgit so with this price and and compare with the the income level uh, that's why malaysia are uh, unaffordable are uh, seriously facing unaffordable house uh, house house uh, uh, unaffordable house so um, so when we, when we look in these uh, tables um how much um, home can afford based on your salary so here is some of the uh, malaysian practice um so when you when you are when you want to buy a house so then based on the national uh, house buyer associations um the suggestion is uh, must not uh, exceeding the third, uh, one third I mean 33 percent so uh, of your dsr uh, home loan so some Shown that ten percent is down payment, thirty five years tenure. This is for 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 young uh, buyers. So thirty uh thirty point five percent interest rates buyer. So spenders thirty percent of a monthly set, uh, salary on home loan. However, the estimation is is above uh, just uh, general guidelines. So uh, it depends also on your your financial uh, obligation. So if you look into this uh, particular table. Uh, you can see that um, your net monthly salary that means it uh, started point is 200,000 so that means you, you need to in your income need to 3,000 3, but if you want to buy a terrace house for example like here is 400,000 price so your income must must at this level that means for those who want to to, to buy a house um, uh, so that means you you are in the middle income group so but uh, and then um uh, if you want to buy a, a apartment so you your your income salary is 400 but compared to previously uh, malaysian um, salary is is far far uh, beyond this rate, this rate that's why we have we have facing seriously um category unaffordable so so before because of that um malaysian government initiative has a uh, produce or establish uh, uh, the housing under 10 uh, Malaysian plans which is Malaysia uh, uh, started to, to to launch the Malaysian plans started uh, in after independent 1957 they, they they launched on the first uh, Malaysian plans which meet uh, which targeted uh, on the economics how they they can they can they can help uh, how to raise the economy of the, the Malaysian people until the nowadays we are we are now uh, from the 2011 until the 2015, um, Malaysian government uh, have initiative uh, launch a, a lot of program and also a lot of schemes. Which is um, we can see here uh, we have uh, for below for property, uh, Malaysian government have launched some of the program to 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 help uh, um, the the below income um, property lines uh, income groups uh, to help them. Uh, to, to at least uh, they can rent or perhaps they can buy their own house house so here is we we have ppr we have um, R, R, rmr this is all the, the scheme and 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 uh, also the program that malaysia government have launched unfortunately even though they have a, a lot of um, uh, scheme and also program that have been launched but still doesn't meet uh, the, the demand the supply is, is doesn't um, meet uh, meet the demands of 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 um, all the demand on of all the the income levels for especially for the B40, sorry, and then um, started in 2015 until 2020. The, under the 11 Malaysian plans, Malaysian government started uh, to launch a new uh, program also new scheme, which is they they raise up uh, the 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 um, the income level so that um, uh, for those who are who are who are who are um, uh, salary because of because of me uh, during this uh, 2016 until 2020 uh, like i said 
um, it's not just B40 facing the problem in, in home ownership and also how uh, on the facing affordable house. Uh, the M40 also facing the same problem. So under the Malaysian um, plans um, from 2016 until 2020, Malaysian government has uh, introduced a new uh, new scheme and, and they are pro uh, introduced another 600,000 units for affordable housing for B40 and also M40. So so this this is all the, 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 this, the program and also the scheme. That is... Uh, doesn't uh, seems like uh, any problems, but uh, and also, government uh, state uh, agency uh, also ha has established uh, recently in two thousand and ninety uh, on the National Affordable Housing uh, Council, which is NAHC. There are a lot of government sector agency and and so on. It, there are around twenty agencies uh, who are helping uh, the, the National Affordable uh, Housing Council. Uh, to, uh, to to provide the affordable house. So um, under the 11 Malaysian uh, plan uh, strategy, they have targeted to to increase the access of affordable house for the target groups. So that means for, for, for B40 and also M40. And then they are strengthening the planning and implement for the better management of public housing. But the role of architects uh, is is to encourage the environmental friendly facility to enhance the live livability. So that means, um, uh, so that is our our role uh, as an academy, uh, as an architect also. So how to to encourage the environmental, uh, the environment friendly facilities, so that uh, they can we can provide the well being and also how we can we can we can have uh, the communities and also social culture into a design so this is our plan uh, this is uh, our roles uh, in in uh, in Malaysian strategies in, in 11 Malaysian strategies so so how um, how to bring uh, the 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 wealth being uh, for for this um, type of program also the scheme so here is the outlook of the public um, housing scheme in Malaysia we will have it this is in Kuala Lumpur, we have in this in Selangor, and so this is uh, Johor states, and this is uh, Kelantan states, and, and this is Penang states. So, so most of them are built uh, 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 flat or, or high-rise housing because of to, to provide uh, 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 affordable house. They think that uh, the, the highest, highest uh, number, the highest floor you can go, uh, the, the highest number units you can provide for them. So, uh, so that is the uh, analogy that is uh, the, the the government think, but unfortunately, uh, so so because of they want to reduce the price and also they want to reduce uh, the cost and so on. So they are they, they think that they are started to 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 build a very minimum square feet area for them uh, for the B forty to live in as 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 minimum six hundred square feet. As you can see here is the the typical floor plan for the uh, for the uh, public housing, we call the PPR house flat. So you can see here we have only um, a living and dining. Uh, this is around 70 um, uh, square meters and we have a three bedroom, we have toilet, kitchen and drying yard. So here is the very typical. And then and then here is uh, they, they try to, to play, play around, uh, they are try to increase uh, the, the square feet, this is for 800, same goes, they have three bedrooms, uh, dining and living room, they shared together. And then the layout of the, of the um, uh, local, uh, low cost flat, which is um, the, the, the public housing in, in Malaysia. The design uh, layout, you can see here, uh, I am highlighting the red one. This is, this is the corridor um, to, to, um, to link to uh, one unit to other unit. So so what? Uh, and then uh, with six hundred square meter, uh, uh, with six hundred square feet. Sorry, with six six hundred square feet units and with very narrow and thin uh, corridor, they link in together. What is the problem? So here is the current character of typical public housing uh, uh, floor plan in Malaysia, which is they are they are long. Corridor. Some of the corridor are very long and narrow, and and so because of the, the the design and the the layout, so so they cannot have a, a natural lighting on that. 
So if you can see here, we have a very narrow and dark hallway, and then this is very thin, um, a thin um, corridor. You can see here, it, it provides a lot of, of problem, if, if you can see here. So this is a very typical uh, character. And then uh, there are lacks of communal area, so no communal area for children to play and also for the community to, 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 to have a, to having a, a meet, meeting also on. So what you can see here, this is the scenario happening in Malaysia. They, 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 they just um, sitting on here, just want to chit chat uh, to, 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 to your neighbor. So here, here is the situation because of we, uh, we use a lot of, uh, of corridor to do everything in corridor. You, 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 you gardening in the corridor, you just um, put your clothes um, uh, in, in corridor. Some, some of your corridor become a storage because of uh, the very minimum uh, layout is only have this, this type of spaces. So, so it's no storage and so on. So everything is happened in the in very tiny corridor. So, so here is no space for the children to play. So, so it, it's it's very dangerous. So they, they just they just uh, uh, ride their bicycles in the very narrow corridor. And uh, the seniors, um, I think uh, in this year there are few numbers that children are falling down from the flats or any uh, flat or any uh, uh, any uh, high rise housing. They are quite few number. Last last month. Uh, they are children uh, are falling down uh, at the uh, 16 story because uh, they are playing because of they know no spaces for communal or there's no facilities for them to play that's why they are playing in in corridors so that is a problem happens okay so here is the design the problem uh, design is because of the uh, the government uh, have uh, give only 600 square feet so 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 they cannot they, they just live in six six hundred with, with their family and and become uh become increasing uh, the the family number become increasing so they they, they they feel that the design is too 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 compact and too uh, too cramped so what they 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 have to do is they do the illegal extension and and additional so if you can see in the picture here here is uh, at the first first uh, floor they just uh, do extension. They just uh, do renovation. This is illegal. So if you can see here, here is also the illegals. Um, they, they they just renovate and 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 do the extensions on the on the uh, public housing or flats or local local flats. So the problem happens when you do the illegal things. So so some of the others you need uh, could 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 happen. Um, could could uh could um could uh, provide the uh could uh cause the problem some of the fire and and so on so so here you can see they, they take the privilege that uh, because of the live in the ground floor so they 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 just do the illegal uh, renovations uh, on the ground floor levels and here also you can see here there are a lot of of numbers um, that that this this happened in the in the uh, in the public housing in Malaysia so so from this uh, is something that that they want to, to portray that is there is something the needs and also the requirement or 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 or, or anything related to the, their their spaces home spaces and units that they need further so so it, it might be um the way the way the the, the occupants uh, or the dweller uh, critics their own um, their own units their their, their own home so the, so this is uh, the turning point this is the issues uh, arise when you are providing uh a very minimum uh, square feet for for them to live in, so just purposely to, to fit it on the supply and demand on affordable housing, and then and and and, and then about the sizes because of total size of uh, of square feet for the single unit is is around two hundred square feet, which is too small for the for for family and also to kids. So uh, so what they they do they, everything and because of um uh low, public ho public housing they did not. Um, provide a storage, so they just put uh, everything storage thing in the corridor. So, so this also um, allows a lot of problems. Your 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 neighbor cannot cannot passing through. Children cannot play here, and and they are causing a lot of problems when 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 we come like this. Okay, and then safety issue. Yes, 
because of the design itself this is our responsible to look in on the safety on the children because of they they uh, they did not uh, aware on this so so mostly and then the design itself because of the the uh, the corridor the the hallway is, is too uh, uh, is uh, is um um what call is is uh, they did not uh, aware on the the children can 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 climb up or 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 anything so 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 they 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 forgot about the issues of safety for the children so so this is the it happened and issues happen on 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 Malaysia public housing so here is uh, uh, I do some survey uh, from for, uh, for them to 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 give a, a feedback on the space size uh, satisfaction so so here is uh, the satisfaction level or the space size so so the rank is means uh, they are extremely dissatisfied so that means the living what is the size uh, what is the space that they are very unsatisfied is the living room and then uh, and then second one is the sizing of the bedroom and then the kitchen toilet and also also yes and then apart from this because of some of the the design of uh, public housing they know balcony and they know storage so so that means they are extremely dis dissatisfied because of their uh, lack of provided uh, this area uh, these spaces so that means they need uh, the balcony so that they can they can they can they can they can go um, uh, they can look uh, on the outside and then they need a storage for them to to to, to keep their, their belongings rather than they put uh, their belongings into the corridor so here is the factor uh, I do also the survey why they do the renovation and extension so so based on this um, survey that, that I found that because of um, the uh, an increasing numbers of the families member that's why they do uh, they do uh, uh, the illegal renovation and extensions and then second one um, based on my, my my study they found that the total size of the house are too minimum for them to, to raise their, their their kids and 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 and, and for their family school so so and 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 part of them they need an additional numbers of room and then second uh, and and fourthly uh, the space function so some of the space function for example like a yard some of them just turning yard to be to become a wet kitchen so so here is uh, this is um 2.9 means uh they this is not a, a significance uh why they want to to to, to renovate their house so here is and then i think uh, the most important thing uh, when we want to provide uh, the, the the house for them the most uh, important thing is we need to understand what is the family growth pattern so that means when when i i do i do um, agree on and dr michael say that that um, um housing is not a privilege this housing is, is is about the needs it's about the um, family needs what are family needs so so we need to understand what is the family growth pattern for example like newly newly wet so 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 mostly uh, for the newly wet they only need uh, one room and then if you are so you have kid one kids and then you you need uh, you are require um uh, two rooms and then you if you have kid uh, two kids so so what is the spaces you uh, what is the big uh, what is the spaces and the sizes of the spaces you need and then if you have three kids and also the the, the four kids so what is the family growth pattern you, you can you can identify and then you can provide them uh, the, the house uh, based on their needs not based on 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 the numbers that 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 uh, the, the affordable housing require so that is the important thing so that uh, we can we can uh, if we, we if we study on the family growth patterns we know exactly how they can they can grow in their home rather than they do uh, rather than uh, a lot of problems face because of uh, here is some of the examples uh, I'm I'm do some of the experimental so for example like um, for for newlyweds so they do only requires uh, one bedroom and then they have children they have they can they can add it to two bedrooms and then uh, three bedrooms and so on so here is some the, some of the experimental uh, for the family growth patterns so. Uh, so uh, this is my my um, my study during my PhD. So um, because of I study on the family growth pattern, so mostly um, uh, I am suggesting uh, them to 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 have um, 
a, a grow home which means they can edit uh, they can add uh, they can add their space based on their needs and based on their family growth so he uh, they started with a, a single a single uh, story and then they can they can they can have renovate their own and then you can they can uh, they can have a uh, four bedroom at least for for their family growth uh, after ten years and so on. So, so what I can, can conclude here is that the culture sensitivity in housing design is is very this is a very crucial uh, um, crucial element that need need to implement in when you are designing affordable housing because of the culturally sensitive housing design that understand the end user lifestyles and also would go far and providing the satisfied living environment for the for its inhabitants so when culture needs uh not meet the result is can be social and exclusion and isolation so the, so this is cause uh the, the source of the the mental health the stress and so on so people have loss of their culture connections tends to suffer mental illness the some of the emotional some of the physical health problem and so on so so it cause the problem and and also affects the the the, 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 the our gen our, our future generation so culturally respond housing and harm the physical and also psychology well-being so this is most important why we need to to understand the, the culture uh, of of who are the end user who live in in that house so the greatest impact of the housing is on the woman because why or woman and also the children because of women and and the children are spend more time at their home so that's why we need to 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 think of the safety of children we need to think what is the the culture and what is the lifestyle of the uh, women and also dwelling size of and overcrowded can hinder the cognitive development of the children so this is in, we need to as an architect as a, a designer as a team builder or as an academic so we can enforce the government to to set up uh, the the minimum space for them uh, to uh, to 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 provide the affordable housing in Malaysia. So here is some of the strategy when we talk about the affordable housing strategy in providing affordable housing. So firstly, uh, we cannot uh, we cannot run away from the how to uh, in when uh, we cannot run away to reduce the cost. So so in reducing the cost. Um, there are a lot a lot way so cost saving in construction uh, the local building material exploration of cheap cheaper new buildings so all this more on the technicalities and then here is the design we need to minimize the corner malfunction and also we can implement also the some of the modular or or, or, or others concept there are a lot of concepts has been established in 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 other countries that we can we can implement also in Malaysia such as a modular flexible space and also grow homes we can have the free prep and so on so um uh, and then we can have um, a strategy in providing a affordable housing in Malaysia is by construction system and material we can have IBS and also prefab but um, um, in Malaysia we 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 do we do have the IBS but unfortunately we did not enforce for 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 providing uh, the 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 public housing uh, by using IBS uh, and 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 the, the number uh, we do enforce but the number still still low on that and then new technology we can invest technology supposedly help this the, the human not uh, because of we, we implement the technology and then the the, the, the new technology it costs you highly so so i do also agree some of the point panels from um, uh, professor michaels yes uh, technology supposedly uh, when 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 i do my PhD. I, I'm proposing uh, my my idea on on grow home. Actually, they are started to buy. Uh, they need to to do to use the this very technology IBS system where where they can uh, play like a Lego. They can plug and play, and then if you need a uh, more no more um uh, room, you can you can just uh, add it uh, in in um in in uh, dry construction and so on. But unfortunately, um uh the 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 factory that, that i meet so for the ibs uh they need to 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 very mass production so i cannot uh, i cannot test my 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 ideations um uh, only the singles so if you can implement the mass mass uh, production the the uh, the cost will reduce about 30 percent so if you cannot if you you just want a single so the the cost will 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 higher more than 30 percent so that is my 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 uh, constraint when I I'm, I'm try to 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 experiment with my ideas on on uh, on uh, how to understand the 
the family growth pattern. So, so he says way forward on on uh, for buying the affordable housing strategy. This is um just adapted um from the Singapore the because of uh, 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 Singapore Housing and Development Boards. Um, I think they they uh, they do successfully how they they they. They, they provide affordable house and then uh, to, to their old citizens. So, so here is a way forward for them. So we, we have to price point uh, of affordable housing. We need to look on the size uh, of affordable housing and then we need to location and specifications and also estimate on the shortage and also affordable house. So here is the challenge prospects in providing uh, affordable housing in Malaysia in reducing a cost. Yes, uh, in, there, there are a lot of challenge in, in the cost um, because of um, I do some a collaboration with with industry for example I do some propose my ideations so so when, when, when we started uh, to do uh, bills of quantities they found out that the margin profit is only 30 percent so that means that is not the profitable so for them they the 30 percent is not a profit for them so that is the problem as when 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 they see the margin profit so so that's why that's why um, uh, affordable housing um, uh, 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 a problem, uh, the supply uh, 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 are less and, and the demand are very high. So, so in order to reducing, uh, the, uh, reducing cost for uh, affordable housing, they need to, to adopt more uh, advanced construction methods such as IBS and so on. So, so also the single entity pull together resource between the ministry and also agency because of why uh, based on my study, also uh, in Malaysia, when 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 uh, when developers started to 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 build uh, affordable uh, housing in a mass production, they are forty one um uh thing or or fee or tax that developer needs to 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 pay uh, before, during, and after they are complete doing the 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 housing uh the housing um uh, production. So. So all this fee and all these tax, they will sum into the the the, the construction cost and and it costs to the to the buyer. That's why the the house price in Malaysia are are soaring or beyond the affordability uh, of the salary uh, and also income in a Malaysian citizen. So that is the really happen. So uh, I think uh, the government, the ministry, or, or and also agency to look back onto the what fees and tax uh, that developer uh, um, they can give the initiative and so on so so they can they, they can have the lower the cost uh, can can reduce the cost of of um, in providing the affordable house and then reduce the compliance cost for the affordable housing uh, for example like uh, like, like say fees bonus and so on and then capital contribution cost to be shared among the developers utilities and companies lower the premiums yes land is also the the major problem why the the housing price are, are soaring in in Malaysia because of uh, the, the 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 land the the price of land are very uh, uh, are, are increasing also because of um, because of um, there are a lot of uh, factors uh, happen for why the land are, 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 are the price of land and are very high so so I think the government as uh, agency also should look into the um, uh, lo uh, lower the, the land premium and also the conversion cost. So, as a conclusion, um, through the review on the Malaysian housing policy in Malaysia, is clearly showed that government has serious taking the actions through their their Malaysian plans from uh, one uh, the first uh, Malaysian plan until now we have uh, eleven and then and then we just uh, established and on the twelve Malaysian plans. We can see that um, government are, are taking serious step uh, in into the into the uh, providing affordable housing, but the increase the quality of living it should meet the demands and constantly need to upgrade the minimum minimum space uh, standards. So to provide the basic housing design approach with an adequate minimum space for the re residents to be satisfactions. Uh, focus on design standard for affordable housing to enhance the quality living. So, so the key point is how to provide the affordable housing with the quality living so that they will li live in the well-being. So, I do also agree on the point of Professor Michael says that 
human being is the best asset, not the housing. So the government should consistently revise the standards and guidelines on the housing development to provide the adequate space criteria. And then the architect also need to play a major role in producing the efficient layouts, innovative design for local flat, for public pu public housing, and also for the for the um, affordable housing for B40 or M40. Uh, income groups in order to meet the ceiling costs of affordable housing without the composing the quality comfort living in the affordable house for with that um i just end my 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 sharing thank you i i pass to back to uh, the mrs uh, moderator uh, okay, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Azalila, for the uh, valuable uh, insight. Okay, uh, thank you to all speakers. It's a very enlightening and interesting topic. Dr. Danny has shared with us the academic experience on teaching modeling with this uh, with his students from the phase zero to completed tasks on prepared uh, cells. Professor Michael has shared with us on valuable insight, which as the individual, or as architect, we are the instruments or hand that uh, holds the tools and methods. The architect is uh, practice aspires architecture. And Dr. Azra has shared on affordable house, which affect the space uh, uh, of layout or floor plan of certain places. The house should providing satisfying living environment. The architect should play a major role in producing efficient layout and innovate design affordable house. Uh, for affordable house. Okay, uh, so uh, now um, with the interest of time, uh, so we should see some questions. Uh, we, okay, we should see the questions. Um, the questions uh, for uh, Dr. Michael, what is the role of architect in designing proper housing for the community as currently architect? Uh, also need to see the side of economy and profit. Uh, could you repeat the last part of the question? Is architects also need to see the side of economy and profits? Well, that yeah, that's what I was trying to get at, and I think I would also want to ask the um, the last speaker. You know, um, <clears throat> we're talking about numbers of cost, but uh, profit. You didn't mention any numbers of what profit taking there is going on. In Canada, a builder of houses typically aims for 30 to 35% profit. And when you take that away from them, they say they're losing money because they're only getting 20%. That's called losing money. And that's not actually losing money, but that's what they say because they've kind of amongst themselves created a, a culture of taking one third of the project profit claiming problems of risk and such things, but profit is not designed for risk. That's the contingency fund that your building, your business should have built into its contracts. So there's a huge profit taking issue. Um, and I think that's around the world. And that's, that would be the one thing, but I think this question that I was asked um, relates to profit, but um, uh, maybe I could, you know, some questions came up to me from the last talk, you know, we were talking about, there was one sentence you wrote in your screen, how to encourage environmentally friendly facilities for enhanced livability. Which I think is a really good uh, question. And my approach would be to say that word encourage, that word encourage is a bit of a problem. Uh, if I take a doctor, right? Doctors can tell us to improve our land, our, our uh, lifestyle. They can encourage us, right, to, to eat better food or to not eat the things we're not supposed to eat. But um, when a doctor comes in to do his work, such as surgery or other techniques of prescribing medicine, there it's an iron hand, right? It's an iron hand. You can't tell a doctor how to how to you know save money. Say so if you need your heart, if you need a heart operation, you have to do it right. You can't just do it halfway. <clears throat> So many problems will come. So then the third one is, you know, as architects, we do have an iron hand with uh, technology, right? We say, you must do this so the roof doesn't leak. You must do this so the windows work. You must do this so that the floor doesn't fall down, things like that. But then we have to give away for budget. Oh, no, 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 we don't have the budget for that. We have to go for the cheaper version, right? So even there, we give up our ground. 
So to answer the question is, there's a, there's a, according to my, my talk also, there's a really big issue with where architects have the iron hand in prescribing. Like we can, as all human beings, we can only um, advise and, and uh, ask people to do the work properly. But the question that right now, architects don't have an iron hand in the design of work. We're only advisors. And of course, there's a secret place where we can all do what we need to do. There's a secret place, which is in the design itself. Nobody knows what we do in our offices. So if you come up with a plan, yes, there will be number crunchers. Yes, there will be economists. There'll be financiers. There'll be accountants who will say, how much is this going to cost, right? But um, if you put on the table something which is uh, properly done, you weaken their stand. And uh, you weaken their arguments because the owner will start to say, but I want this. So uh, I, I think I kind of indirectly answered your question there because it's a very, very broad question. And I think my whole talk was kind of addressing that issue that um, it's not so much about the economics. If the ground for why we house each other as the great community of humanity if the grounds for how we house each other are so strongly based in um, somebody else making money off your well-being. And the architect has traditionally been a professional to create sort of baselines of minimal uh, environmental quality. And if we don't stand up for those, if we don't find a way as an individual and as a profession to respond to that with the authority of being a professional who, for example, knows that windows are a requirement in a house uh, because of very important parameters that have to do with even our scientifically documented well-being. If you can't stand up for that, then you can't stand up for your profession. And, and we can't sometimes, it's really hard, you know, they have to walk away walk away and let it become a misery. So um, I think your question um, is about a really fundamental issue in terms of your practice. You have to decide where you're gonna be. And then if you get that stature in your own practice, you have a chance to change the wider field. Okay, um, another question for you, Dr. Michael. Um, value plays an important role in defining how we live. In your opinion, what can we do as the public to overcome the issue of housing as much as determined by the policy maker and politician? Yeah. Well, as an architect, you have some power. As um, I found that in in um, in people who aren't architects, uh, architects think a lot differently than people. I've noticed that in my marriage, my wife is not an architect, and oh my gosh, we have such a different way of looking at things, you know. So if you're talking about the general public, who are not architects, having an influence, hmm, I, that would be, um, of course, it's to not accept. Uh, I would say first of all. Don't accept the complaining of contractors and builders and property developers and real estate agents. Don't accept the complaints from those people because they are making so much money off the work that they don't do. I mean, they do work to help out, but the fact is that if you take a building in Canada, between 30 and 40% of that building goes to profit and real estate and then if you add in the building fees, which, for example, are not bad in Canada, if you add in building fees, which generally go for the general welfare, right? If you give fees to the government, that comes back in other ways. So fees to the government in a, in a non-corrupt government would be a positive good for the general well-being of the world, right? Uh, I wouldn't say that fees are necessarily bad. It depends on how they're used, right? But um, as, as we know, the government does things that individuals can't do themselves and fees go toward that. So, 
But if you take um, that almost that only 60% of your house is actually direct value. And from that 60%, you also take the money that the architect is making and all the subcontractors are making money too. The, 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 the 40, the 30% profit, the huge profit margin is only for the overall building construction. So, I mean, it's a really tough question, but I think that we have to find other models. Of building and as a general public, one of the models that I know is to say, take cooperatives. You enter into cooperative communities with other people together. I think that would be 1 of the most powerful ways to avoid to, to do something as an individual who is not an architect. Take on cooperative and community actions. That would be number 1. As a community that is united or as a cooperative of united people, you have power. Uh, that, that would be the number one mechanism that you can use. Okay, um, so we have actually one more question for you, but we will read uh, a question for Aziz, uh, as uh, Dr. Azila Plesia. Yeah? Okay, uh, Malaysia facing issues on public housing, especially on cultural values of many different backgrounds and races. So how can we create a housing planning that can cater for all needs? Yes, because uh, uh, thank you for the question. Yes, we need to 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 um to um uh to appreciate uh, all the 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 races because of we we living in in multi culture and multi races. We have India, we have Chinese, and also we have Malay living in the same country. So what we can do is um culture is not what uh what is about the costume, their belief, and so on. So, so the culture in, in this particular thing is what is their lifestyle. So, so, so um, based on my experience, um, we can do some of the survey uh, for, for the pilot project so that we do understand on, on the set what is the, the, the difference um, needs. I think because of they live in Malaysia, so, so the lifestyle could be same. So I think uh, in, in providing um, uh, 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 public housing for to cater the different races and different ethnic. So the baseline is there. What is their satisfaction? What is their lifestyle? So 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 based on that, the baseline is that. Then we can cater the 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 social and also the culture. So so I think um we we need to 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 provide some of the survey. We need to 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 understand what are the, their needs and also we need to understand the lifestyle in Malaysia. So so. Even though they are different, but but I believe that they have a certain baseline. There are certain satisfaction. There are certain of uh, requirement and so certain needs that that could be same. So we can analyze them and we can we can provide uh, we can we can propose uh, for them to, uh, for them even though we have different uh, uh, ethnic and also different races. So that's my 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 point. Thank you. Okay. Uh, we have a last question for uh Prof Michael. Okay, uh, such a meaningful sharing on human and well-being in housing development. We are all aware that with windowless environment may affect the uh, occupants uh, psychological, uh, psychologically. However, due to insensitivity of the home provider or developer, this phenomenon keep on appear in the housing industry, including the Malaysia, in Malaysia. What would you advise to overcome this problem? Thank you. To overcome the problem that people are continually propose things, buildings like this? Yeah. Oh. Well, education is the obvious thing that uh, there's, you know, if you look at Mr. Munger, he's 97 years old today. Uh, you could say, well, at 97, he's not going to learn much. Maybe he's too old to learn anything. Um, I think on one level, your question is just like, how do we avoid having ignorant people in the world? Uh, how do we make people interested in things? I don't know. You know, how do we, I think there will be ignorance in the world forever. Um, or at least for the next thousand years until something happens. But uh, if. I think um, the last question actually touches on something, you know, 
a lot of the changes in the world have come because of general uh, a general upheaval. Like uh, a lot of people get together and they become very frustrated with something and they start to act out and the government has to listen because there are, are numbers of people. So, uh, you know, that's how unions were created in the world uh, a century ago. They started creating unions because so many people were fighting against these terrible conditions in which they were working. And unions are big in Europe and of course, I mean, it's actually formed Europe now and they're, uh, you know, somewhat there in Canada and virtually not there in the US, but unions are one way that people have created something by getting together in large groups. Um, if we're talking about students needing housing and the housing is so expensive. And um, I think the, the way to do it is that somebody would have to provide an alternate solution. I think that the need is for an alternate solution to show that there are other ways to do things. But um, that depends on a certain amount of money or on generosity of somebody doing it for free. And if you do something for free, you have no power. It has to be a problem like, oh, I did this, sir, you wanna look at it, it's important. And they'll say, well, why would it be? You're not, you don't even have the contract. So you don't have any real power if you do something for free. Um, that is why I did my talk the way I did, because the question, you end up being chased back further and further and further back into initial premises. The reason we're running into this problem is because People don't take housing as seriously as food or medicine or clothing. We all expect to be clothed. We all expect to get food. We all expect housing because we need it. If people don't take housing seriously in the first level, saying if the government policy is not good and if you're bad at doing business, you live on the street. It's your fault. You lose and you are a loser because you don't have the money to buy a house. Your family is a loser. Your wife shouldn't have married you. It's just your fault. As long as we think that way, then it's also possible to say housing can be sick. Housing can make you sick. Housing can make you lose your family because you can't live that way. Uh, people get sick and die or want to run away. So it's all part of the same problem. The possibility to make incredibly um, dangerous housing is the same as not having housing at all. The same reason. And the only way to do it is that um, my proposal is that architects, when they design a house, take a wider view of it. And consider, you know, when we do a zero, a net zero building electrically. Using electricity and other sources of power, right? It's partially. For the benefit of the owners, because ultimately after 5 years or 10 years, the house costs nothing. You've paid it off, right? You don't have to pay for electricity. All the things are free, so to speak, because God provides. And, and, uh, I think that. That would, that's why, I mean, the same thing would have to happen. Um, in, in, in dwellings in terms of the other qualities. That if you, if you do these things you will be better and safer and more healthy, right? And the architect can prove that. But uh, the, the answer is, I mean, all three of the questions I got are interesting because in one sense, it's a problem that is unsolvable under today's parameters. Under the general parameters of today, it's all just, you know, government policy and a little bit of here and a little bit of there to just kind of sort of like take away the worst of it. But my argument is that our societies have made, found that the best way to make a lot of money is to make people desperate. And desperation is not having a house. So all of that is part of the power of capital being used against, I'm not a Marxist or a socialist or a communist or anything, but it just becomes evident that the pain of life is what is driving so much of our economy at a very, very, very low level. Our economies are minimum economies because they're not based on well-being. They're based on survival. 
And that's the fundamental problem. And architects don't do well in a society about survival. Engineers do better. So that would be my answer to that. And it's not a finished answer. You have to work on it. If you're a young person, you've got a career now. Go ahead. Make it better. Okay. Oh, that's very interesting. Okay. Um, uh, okay. It looks like we have uh, covered all the questions. Okay. Before we end the webinar, uh, I would like to take some photo or pictures as mementos or memories. So uh, kindly uh, on your video, so we'll be able to capture the picture. Uh, so I hope that uh, everyone can open the video. Okay. Here they come. Okay. Um, all right. So one, uh, two, three, smile. Okay. Just hang on. Okay, one more. One, two, three. All right. Okay. Okay, uh, we are at the end of the webinar. On behalf of Architecture Program UTM and speakers, we would like to say thank you very much for joining us today. And uh, we shall see everyone meet next time. And have a pleasant day. Thank you very much. And assalamu alaikum. Thank you. Thank you all. Hope to see you um, all again. Dr. Yes, Alice, uh, thank again. you. You you are the one who gave us the opportunity to present in a forum like this. <laughs> yes, okay. Thank you so much, Dr. Madhu. We'll, we'll, we'll see you again tomorrow. On tomorrow. The <laughs> yeah, we are ready. <laughs> yes, tomorrow. Uh, okay, mm -hmm. thank you. Take care and stay safe, everyone. Thank you, Prof. Michael. Thank you. Thank you to all team from VIT. Okay. Bye, all. Hope to see you again soon, tomorrow. Thank you. Thank you, all. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.